so today we have uh, a special guest, one of our, our beloved Dr. Tom Holsinger Friesen. And he is friends, he's brought a few friends from his small group from church and his wife who are upstairs. Good to see you guys. I happen to go to seminary with both Sarah and Dr. Tom and uh, have known them uh, for years and years. And it is a joy to be serving alongside them here in Spring Arbor. And I know that uh, he has spent, we, had, we went through Hebrews and he chose this passage as one that he would want to speak on and he has spent lots of time thinking and praying about this passage. And as he brings this word to us, I ask that you would just do one thing. That today, as he shares, that you would prepare your heart just to think about, think deeply about what God's word would inspire us to know about who he is and who we are. And allow Dr. Tom and the, the words that he has prepared lead us to that place. So uh, we're going to pray for him between uh, worship and his message. So if you would just stand with me as we pr prepare for worship. Yeah, guys, we're going to continue to communicate with the Lord and just welcome his presence this morning. So I'd like to invite Dr. Tom to come down, and um, I'd like to also invite anyone who'd like to pray over him, pray over this time and this moment. Yeah, Jesus, we just acknowledge in this moment how real you are. God, how your presence is in this room with us. Jesus, and we also acknowledge that you being who you say you are is the greatest news that we could ever receive, God. Because what the cross tells us, Jesus, is that you desire for your presence to be with us, God. The ideal spot for your presence is to be with your people, God, despite our brokenness, Jesus. So I pray this morning, God, that we would run full force into your arms, Jesus. I pray that we would know that you tore down every single thing that could possibly get in the way between us and you, Jesus. We thank you so much for your love, God. I pray over Dr. Tom right now. God, I thank you for who he is and what he's done for this campus. Jesus, I pray that you would speak through him. I pray that we would feel your presence in what he says, God. And I just acknowledge once again, you're in the room speaking to us, God. We love you so much, God. In your name, amen. Well, first of all, I think you all should be warned, okay? So I'm not so much of a preacher as I am an Old Testament professor. So in this sermon slash lecture, I'm going to argue that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's plan for us. But in order to get there, I'm going to talk about a few other things, things like blood, Hittite warriors, Narnia, and beer, and also God's buzzing around a dead animal like flies. Um, but first, I want to talk to you about family. So we were sitting uh, in church, oh, some time ago. Our son Samuel was about four or five years old at the time. <clears throat> And the offering had just been taken. And, uh, well, here's a picture of Sam. Whoops. Whoa, that's fast. OK, yeah. There, no, nope, oh, yep, there we go. There he goes, yeah. Uh, Dr. Kono warned me about this, this thing. But um, so Samuel looked about like this at that age. And so we're in church. The offering had been taken. Uh, the doxology was being sung, you know, the praise God from whom all blessings flow. And as soon as that final amen, was sung, it was very quiet. And then we heard this, and uh, yeah, we looked down, it was our son, yeah. And uh, thinking, okay, great, this is a little embarrassing, um, but I just don't understand. So after the service, I talked to Samuel and I said, Samuel, um, you know, 
why did you say cock-a-doodle-doo in the middle of the service? And yeah, there's a little reminder, cock-a-doodle-doo. Um, and he said, well, Dad, I just wanted everyone to know that I'm here. <laughs> okay, uh, makes perfect sense, I guess. I don't know. It's not like this kid is invisible. I mean, he's the one when um, on Easter Sunday, uh, as the choir is recessing out in the middle of the aisle, he just throws up and they had to kind of walk around. So this kid, people know him, am I right? They see him. Um, so he wanted to let everyone know that he was here. And um, this kind of brings up this topic I want to talk about today, presence, so presence. We find ourselves in a lot of communities, so Spring Arbor University, our family, our church, and all of these communities involve our willingness to be present to other people, present to God, and maybe present to ourselves. Um, here's a picture of a Valentine that our daughter, Leah, wrote to herself. And um, this was last week, uh, to Leah, from Leah, love you. <laughs> and um, so is this, oh, and here's a, a picture of her. Um, and so is this an example of someone being present to themselves? I don't know, but I needed to get her into the sermon. So here's her shout out. And um, we've... This is her third year of a, of a selfie Valentine, so maybe it's a whole free tradition by now. And we've been working on self-confidence, and maybe now we need to work on humility. But, um, <laughs> well, here's the Valentine. On the front it says, let's taco about how great you are. And there's taco. Let's taco about how, how great you are. Um, but any rate, uh, although my home base is the theology department, I'm also involved in the CORE program. Maybe you've heard of it. Um, it's a series of interdisciplinary courses that help us understand and build community in ever-widening circles. So first, in CORE 100, we consider our liberal arts university community. And uh, nothing quite uh, brings us together like a Cedar Bend do-it-yourself chicken dinner, right? Am I right? Okay. Yeah, um, yeah, Kassadudu. Um, here's a picture from some years ago. You might recognize some folks there, There's Lauren and others. But I also want to give a shout out to Core 19, my most recent core. Where are you? Yeah, all right. Um, here's some of them. And uh, so Core is awesome. <laughs> and uh, think about, okay, moving on to Core 200. And then core 274, 275, we explore the rich diversity that we find in communities, both here and abroad. And the Christian community is our, uh, its practices, its beliefs. This is our focus in core 300. And then in the senior capstone core 400, we look ahead to the future communities that you'll encounter after graduation. You may have noticed then this common a uh, thread that ties it all together is this notion of community and um, sharing connectedness, presence, life held in common with one another. And how about our connectedness with God? How is it possible that we as finite creatures can actually share life together with an almighty God? If you had me for survey of the Old Testament, you might remember that I suggested that the key question that the book of Leviticus addresses is not merely how can I get my sins forgiven, as important as that is, but rather the more foundational one, how can an unholy people live with a holy God? We'll have a better understanding of the message of Hebrews if we take some time to consider the role of blood sacrifice in Old Testament times. And uh, if you need a visual aid, that here you go. Um, the book of Hebrews in the Bible was probably not written as a letter, as were many of Paul's works, for example. It was most likely a sermon that has been written down, and 
possibly the oldest, the most ancient Christian sermon we have record of, there's reason to suspect that the people addressed in this sermon were converts from paganism. The speaker is encouraging them not to leave the Christian faith and convert to Judaism. Christ, says the author, is the fulfillment of all that the Old Testament anticipates. It is Christ who enables a new covenant, a new community comprised of God and his people. Christ is that reality that renders as mere shadows all that went before. So let's take a look at today's passage, Hebrews 10. Sorry, rookie driver up here. Um, this is from the Common English Bible. The law can never perfect the ones who are trying to draw near to God through the same sacrifices that are offered continually every year. If people, if the people carrying out their religious duties had been completely cleansed once, no one would have been aware of sin anymore. Instead, these sacrifices are a reminder of sin every year because it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. He says above, and here he's quoting from the Old Testament, you didn't want and you weren't pleased with sacrifices which are offered because the law requires them. Then he said, look, I've come to do your will. He puts an end to the first to establish the second. We have been made holy by God's will, by God's will, through the offering of Jesus Christ's body once for all. Every priest stands every day serving and offering the same sacrifices over and over, sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when this priest offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, he sat down at the right side of God. The Holy Spirit affirms this when saying, and here's another Old Testament quote, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After these days, says the Lord, I will place my laws in their hearts and write them on their minds. And I won't remember their sins and their lawless behavior anymore. Where there is forgiveness for these things, there is no longer an offering for sin. Okay. So taking a hint then from the writer of Hebrews, let's examine some Old Testament perspectives on sacrifice and on divine presence to better understand the unique person and work of Christ. But first here's a question for you. What do you do if there is an epidemic? Maybe you wash your hands more frequently, watch the news closely, pray, hope that government officials can contain this, uh, stop the spread, hope that scientists can formulate a vaccine. Well, what do you do if there's an epidemic and you are an ancient Hittite person living in modern-day Turkey but 1,300 years before Christ? Well, I'm glad that you asked that question because uh, here's what one of their text records uh, states. Okay, so according to this text, if an epidemic occurs in the land or in the army camp, I perform this ritual. When day turns to night, all who are army commanders, every one prepares a ram. They may be black or white. I string one pearl and one ring of iron and lead, and I tie them to the necks of, horns and of the horns of the rams. They tether the rams for the night and say the following. Whatever God is stirring or wandering below, whatever God has caused this plague, for you I have secured these rams. Be satisfied with these. Now to you, O oh God, we have given cooked food, including meat, bread, and, dare I say it, beer. Uh, eat and drink like a god. Don't cast it aside. Then they bow down and come away. Now, if you think this sounds absurd, uh, I agree. I agree with you. It is crazy. But before we dismiss it, Let's think about why the Hittites did what they did and what it may reveal about our common human nature. Because I think that we can imagine ourselves to be just completely different when maybe we're not. 
Like ancient people, we are deeply conflicted about God's presence in our lives. Deep in our subconscious, maybe we discover that we're afraid of God. Maybe we'd be happy for God to stay away because, well, maybe he's displeased with us. As a result, we run away. Secondly, if we need something from God, we may use all sorts of things to try to manipulate God, intentionally or not. Maybe if I spent more time in worship or scripture reading, God's presence would come closer and maybe God would be more apt to hear my prayer. Hebrews 10 gives us a completely different perspective. God has come to us unilaterally and his intention is to bless and not to harm. This is why the Christian gospel truly is good news. Okay, now to the Old Testament. In Numbers uh, chapter 22, we read that the people of Israel, after God had delivered them from slavery in Egypt, are camped on the, out, on the east side of the Jordan River. They can see that land that God had promised to give them. But folks around are not so happy that they're there. And uh, the king of Moab, Balak, hires Balaam, who is kind of a magician-type fellow from Mesopotamia, He hires them to pronounce a curse on Israel, presumably so that Moab would be victorious if they went to battle against Israel. There's an interesting narrative here, um, you know, uh, an angel, a talking donkey, but we'll need to skip to the next part. Balaam tells Balak that in effect he's not a sorcerer, that is, he can't use magic to change the future, but he will try to predict the future. In Numbers 23, Balaam reveals the tools of his trade. He says to Balak, quote, build me seven altars and prepare seven bulls and seven rams for me. After Balaam offered the sacrifices, he said to Balak, stay here while I go aside. Perhaps the Lord will come to meet me. Whatever he shows me, I will tell you. Now we know on the basis of many ancient Near Eastern texts that all cultures in the area offered animal sacrifices to the gods. The most primitive and basic meaning was this. Now, the gods may have great power to control the weather and fertility, but they still need to eat. So if you wave some food at them, you'll attract their attention. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, which has some similarities with the biblical story of Noah, the great flood recedes, and the Noah-like figure offers a sacrifice to the gods. These gods, quote, smelled the sweet savor and crowded like flies around the sacrifice. In the biblical account in Genesis 8.21, after Noah has offered his post-flood sacrifice on Mount Ararat, we read that, quote, when the Lord smelled the pleasing odor, he said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of humankind, end quote. The Hebrew word for pleasing odor is related to the meaning of Noah's name, to cause to rest, or to tranquilize, or to assuage. God's anger, it would seem, is calmed down as a result of this sacrifice. Okay, time out here, time out. This is about the point in the sermon when uh, I was going over it with my wife, and hi Sarah, I love you, she's up there. She said, hold on, you're going to need to, you know, break up. This is really getting dense here. Um, She's probably right. You need a little break. So thanks to Valerie, who's also here. Um, She's the the queen of Facebook memes. Um, You need to see this. So this is one that she sent, all right? I'll just let you read it. Okay. (laughs) I have no comments on that, but it is pretty clever, so thank you, Valerie. Um, What did C.S. Lewis have hidden in his wardrobe? Nanya nanya business. Um, Okay, so you with me? With me? All right, forget all that now, or the Narnia part. Let's go back and remember the big picture here. Sacrifice is intended to bring about the God's presence, at least in the ancient Near East. If you were living in ancient times, you might want to bring the gods close for a variety of reasons, to hear a word, 
from him as Balaam sought, to stop an epidemic, to get God to march with your armies and bring you a victory. Think about King Saul's rash uh, disobedience when he offered that sacrifice just before the battle. Think about the Israelite army, how foolish they were when they brought the Ark of the Covenant into battle with them because they thought, if we bring God's presence, we'll be invincible. It didn't work that way. The God of the Bible cannot be manipulated. In fact, there are a number of Old Testament passages in which God ridicules the very notion that he needs to eat and thus would be obliged to honor sacrifices. Another reason that the ancient people used sacrifices to bring the gods near was to sit down and share a meal with them. Remember this point. It has implications for how we might understand the significance of Holy Communion, that sharing in the body and blood of Christ. To sum up then, ancient people knew they couldn't compete with the gods when it came to raw power, but they did believe they'd crack the code. Using ritual, they could manipulate the gods. And we find a curious mixture in ancient and modern times of human attitudes toward divinity. There's hubris or pride, and also fear. Fear. After all, if the gods were displeased with you, they could bring terrible punishment. Oh, and if you're curious about what happened with Balaam, he does get a word from God, but this word is a word of blessing toward Israel rather than cursing, much to the frustration of King Balak. In Leviticus, a, a challenging book for sure, sacrifice is offered or is depicted as affecting our relationship with God in other ways. For example, a blood sacrifice would act as a spiritual detergent of sorts. Application of animal blood could cleanse sacred things, like the furnishings in the tabernacle or the temple that were close to God's presence in the Holy of Holies. Hebrews 10, 1 to 2, assumes this purification view. <clears throat> um, it can never, speaking of the blood, it can never perfect that is, make complete the ones who are trying to draw near to God through the same sacrifices that are offered continually every year. Otherwise, wouldn't they have stopped being offered if, people, if the people carrying out their religious duties had been completely cleansed once, no one would have been aware of sin anymore. Now, other Old Testament texts portray sacrifice as a ritual payment or a means of ran ransom in Leviticus 1711, God asserts, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you for making atonement for your lives on the altar. The blood is sacred. It belongs to God, and as such is not to be consumed by humans, but returns to him, the source of life. If a person sinned, their life could be forfeit, rightly owed to God, but under the law, God would allow a sacrifice, an animal sacrifice, to be a substitute for that person. Now, the Hebrew word for atone or atonement, from the verb kafar, has this root meaning of to cover. So a kippah, from that same root, is a head covering worn by devout Jewish men. Also, the word could refer to the cover of the Ark of the Covenant, translated in Hebrews as the mercy seat. In a figurative sense, Kafar can imply the removal of an obligation. Now imagine that you're with your friends, you're at Applebee's, and one of them grabs the check and says, I'll cover that. I'll remove that obligation that you have to pay. I'll wipe it out. This is the meaning of atonement. Hebrews 2.17 reads, Therefore he, Jesus, had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make a sacrifice of atonement, a covering for the sins of the people. Now, whether ancient people used sacrifice to attract or appease the gods or to cleanse themselves or to provide a substitute for their sins, the purpose was always the same, to do whatever it took to be in the presence of God to do whatever it took to be in the presence of God. 
There is development in the way that biblical Israel came to understand God and what God is like. I'd call this progressive revelation. Little by little, just as a parent teaches a child, God reveals that older understandings of him were incomplete but yet they prepared the way for fuller revelation. In Isaiah 1, God says, what should I think about all your sacrifices? I don't want the, bull, the blood of bulls, lambs, and goats when you come to appear before me. Now for some Jews living in the Qumran community around the time of Christ, animal sacrifices were not offered. Praises to God were viewed as substitutes for animal sacrifices. And uh, we even read in an older English translation of Psalm 22.3 that God inhabits the praises of Israel. When we sing and offer praise and worship, as we did this morning, we are giving to God what we have and are asking him to come close to us. Micah 6.8, the prophet declares that instead of sacrifices, the Lord requires his people to, quote, act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with him. Later, we read in Mark's gospel that loving God with all one's heart, mind, and strength and loving one's neighbor is much more important than all kinds of sacrifices. Loving God, loving neighbor. But there's a problem that Moses and the prophets identified almost from the beginning Our hearts needed to be changed so that we could love God with all that we are, so that we could love our neighbor as ourselves. And sin hinders this. It's a heart problem. According to Hebrews, Jesus, by his life and self-offering, solves the problem of sin. And this problem of sin is actually twofold. First, we we need freedom from the sin itself, the obligation, the offense, There are a few folks in my prophets class this morning and we've been reading some from Ellen Davis. What is sin? Well, one way of looking at it, Ellen Davis says, sin is a violation of the covenantal nature of reality. God created us within this grand web of connectedness. We're meant to live in healthy, life-giving relationships with God, with other people, and even with non-human creation our decision to deny that connectedness, to cut ourselves off from others, pretend independent, that's the rejection of God and, from, and of the, the life that comes from God, we're as good as dead. According to Hebrews 9.26, Christ has appeared once and for all at the end of the age to remove sin by the sacrifice of himself. Our relationships can be healed such that we can serve as conduits of God's gift of life to others. Life flows through you to others. But Hebrews, okay, so we need freedom, we need salvation from sin itself, but there's the second part of the problem of sin, our consciousness of sin. Hebrews 10, 2 talks about that. And if the former, the sin itself, is objective, this consciousness of sin is subjective. It's internal. In short, it's when our minds constantly feed us this lie that God is angry with us. God is displeased. That because we've sinned, God has withdrawn his presence from us. We're afraid, like ancient people, that either God has abandoned us and is far distant or that God is present, but he's either indifferent or outright hostile toward us. Isaiah 40 speaks of a time when God's people lived in exile in Babylon. According to the many prophets that God had sent their way, the people's sin would eventually corrupt the land to the extent that the land itself would literally vomit them out. And they went into exile. Their worst fears were realized when in 587 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem, destroyed, burned the temple to the ground, the very place where God's presence rested. But now Isaiah speaks to this people in exile, and he says this, comfort, 
Comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And then the writer of Mark's gospel cites this passage when talking about the coming of Jesus to his people. He has come to bring them out of captivity and to be present to them. But the problem was this. The people still thought God was angry with them, that their sins were still keeping them from him. So if you think someone's really angry with you, what do you do? You hide. See Adam and Eve. Avoid God's presence at all costs, and maybe God will leave you alone. Maybe use religion to keep God at arm's length. But if we hide, we miss the blessed opportunity for healing, restoring of relationships. According to Luke 1, God's people are meant to receive knowledge of salvation, knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. It's possible that the gospel sometimes isn't heard as good news because it's explained in a way that's too abstract, too churchy, but it's actually quite simple. The gospel. There is a God. God is not angry with you. God has never been angry with you. God is closer to you than you'd ever guess. And God is slowly transforming your heart to be able to love others in the way he designed you from the beginning. Receive God's presence. Stop resisting. Stop running. He's taken care of all the barriers. You can trust that God will be good to you. Jesus proves this. One commentator put it this way. If God is God, then God can forgive sin if he chooses. There are no rules outside of God that he has to follow. Otherwise, it is these rules that would be God. Jesus comes to tell us that God has chosen to forgive our sins. And Jesus' life reveals what God's forgiveness and restoration looks like. Maybe Jesus didn't come to change the Father's mind about us. Maybe Jesus came to change our mind about the Father. After all, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Their desires are perfectly aligned. It's not that one wants to punish us and the other wants to have mercy on us. But our view of God has sometimes tended to be like that of ancient people. Now in Hebrews 8, the author refers to the new covenant that Jeremiah prophesied that God would give his people. He would place his laws within our hearts such that everyone would know him. He would no longer, quote, remember our sins. This new relationship inaugurated in Christ would make the first one obsolete. What makes the new covenant new? Well, we don't need to be terrified of God. In dozens of places in the Bible, when God or one of his angels comes to someone and the first words are, fear not. From the beginning of time, fear has dominated the way we view God. Now this can change. It's such an irony. You know, the human race has tried all sorts of things very carefully to bring God close without getting killed. We thought we had to feed the gods by giving them the lives of animals. But now in Jesus, and experienced in Holy Communion, God feeds us by giving us his own life. We thought that getting God to come near to us was all up to us. Are we worthy enough? Are we offering the right gift? But the great irony is this. God's fullest revelation of himself, his gift, his greatest gift of presence in Jesus, it had nothing to do with our efforts. It didn't. God acted unilaterally, not out of necessity, but out of love. Now, not even sin or the awareness of sin, the condemnation of sin needs to keep, uh, it, 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 
no longer keeps God's presence from us. Jesus' final words before ascending into heaven were, Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And John Wesley, founder of Methodism, his last words on his deathbed were these, Best of all, God is with us. In the end, salvation, being in life-giving community with God, has never been about our worthiness. It's always been about God's goodness and God's ability to make this community possible. We don't need to do crazy antics like Balaam and countless others to try to bring God close. Our very body, as well as the corporate body of Christ, the church, is the temple where God's presence rests. Now, we could resist that presence, we could run from it, but why? In God's presence, we find our true identity. We receive strength and receive healing. We grow in our knowledge and our capacity to love. Irenaeus of Lyon, a second century bishop, noted a great irony here. When God's spirit transforms us to be more God-like, we become more fully human. The glory of God, he says, is a human being fully alive. We come to life by living in community, sharing the gift of presence with God, with others, and with all of creation. And now, in closing, would you receive this blessing from Paul's? Second letter to the Corinthians, and here's a little uh, slide for you. Be in harmony with each other, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Thank you. You are dismissed.